After the shift to agriculture and the growth in cities and empires, a lot of technological progress occurred. The Egyptians invented paper and medicines, the Romans invented concrete and aqueducts, the people of ancient Mesoamerica, like the Maya, Aztec, and Toltec, invented chocolate, which was frankly an incredible feat, and the Chinese invented the compass, gunpowder, and printing. Nevertheless, in all of these places, income per head barely budged. The typical person in these times was living on just a few dollars per day by today's standards. So why, with all of this progress, was humanity stuck in poverty? The answer is the Malthusian trap. The subsistence level is a standard of living that provides only the bare necessities of life. That is, when it comes to the necessities, people are getting just what they need to keep on living. In the late 1700s, the English economist Thomas Malthus laid out a mathematical explanation for why we would never be able to escape mass poverty. Here's the gist of his theory. Pretty much everyone is living at the subsistence level. Then, technology improves. This better technology raises productivity and increases our total production, allowing some to live above the subsistence level. But these greater means lead to greater population because more humans will be able to survive with this greater level of total production. The excess wealth is consumed by a larger population, thus splitting the pie more ways such that everyone gets a subsistence size piece. In simple terms, if we are able to increase our production of food, then that expands the capacity for our population. Without any population controls, that means pretty much everyone lives at the subsistence level. And should the population ever grow beyond the capacity of our economy to support it, the result will be a Malthusian catastrophe, like war, famine, or plague, which kills people off until we are balanced again. We can evaluate the Malthusian trap mathematically with a graph. Essentially, what Mathis was saying is that population grows exponentially, but our technological progress, especially in food production, grows linearly. Where they cross is where we invite a Malthusian catastrophe, because a population beyond this point will be in excess of the amount of food available. Evidence in favor of Malthus and his conception of the economy was the plague of the 14th century. Many regions around the world, but especially in Europe, had a rough time farming through the Little Ice Age, which brought a lot of famine. These difficulties brought about a lot of warfare and pillaging and gave rise to the famous Mongol Empire of Genghis Khan. But a disease started to spread in the mountainous regions of modern-day China, which was picked up by the Mongols and spread around Eurasia, arriving in Europe in 1346. The plague was actually three different diseases. The bubonic plague was the most common, and it killed about 50 to 60 percent of those who contracted it. The pneumonic plague was less common, but deadlier, killing about 90 percent of those who got it. And the septicemic plague, which was rare, was a near certain death sentence. China lost one half to two thirds of its population to plague. In Paris in, in 1348, it killed 800 people per day. London lost about 40% of its population over the course of the plague. The Middle East lost about one third of its population and Egypt lost about 40%. Approximately one-third of the whole human population perished, and about half of the people of Eurasia died. The death toll is difficult to even estimate, and some sources put it as high as 200 million people. This turned the economy on its head. Where once labor was cheap and land expensive, now land was cheap and labor was expensive. This broke the feudal system and restructured the economies of the world. 
As Mathis would predict, wiping out half of the population meant an increase in living standards for a short time. In this way, we can think of Thanos in the Marvel movies as a Malthusian in his thinking. Prices fell and wages rose, increasing people's real income. Many towns were abandoned and less farmland was used compared to before the plague. Many peasants were able to increase their holdings and there were fewer living in poverty. Meanwhile, elites seeking to protect their wealth promoted protectionist policies and formed powerful guilds. Most people of this time did not associate themselves with their kingdom, but rather their town. Towns would put these protective policies in place, charging a tax on goods coming into the town. However, as these policies became widespread, many began to see them as a detriment. Protectionist policies were relaxed to help the town's merchants abroad seek special trade agreements. The city of Antwerp, for example, liberalized their trade policies and opened themselves up to free trade. No one could know it at the time, but they were setting an example that would eventually come to dominate European cities and change the world in a way that would be unrecognizable to Mathis and would render his theory obsolete as an explanation for the world.